Lucy, thank you for joining us. Deeply appreciate you agreeing to spend some time. How are you today? I'm very good. I'm sat here on the west coast of Mexico looking out to the ocean. So things are good. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for getting in touch and for wanting to talk today. Amazing. Well, first of all, I'm jealous because I'm in Massachusetts where it's currently <laughs> about zero degrees Celsius and uh, very windy. So different, yeah. very different scape outside than you're currently witnessing. Um, time to book your trip down here. Yes. <laughs> it was still there. This is the way. So I'd love to start off our conversation with a little bit about kind of who you are, what you do. And then I'd like to pivot into sort of your history. How did you, how did you get here? So maybe a little bit about sort of the, what brings you to the West coast of Mexico and what, what is it exactly you do there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was actually born in a very small village in the north of England that's right on the border with Scotland. Sheep farming town, not a lot happening, uh, just mostly green hills, a pretty bleak climate too, maybe not quite as cold mm. as Massachusetts. Very dark. Yes, very, very yeah. cloudy. I don't miss the winters, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, I, I think like a lot of people, uh, I ended up in this wellness space because I was dealing with a lot of physical and mental health issues. And I kind of started connect. I started a while back connecting dots as to how I got into the position I was in. But it really started from being very young. I had a lot of digestive issues and um, I actually just would not eat any meat. I was brought up in a like a very meat and potatoes family um, <laughs> this didn't know what to do with me. So I think some pieces could be somewhat malnutrition. Um, but when I kind of went through, you know, adolescence and, and into early adulthood, I just, these issues compounded. So it was from uh, digestive issues to a huge hormonal imbalance. Like just puberty was a nightmare for me. <laughs> like I just, it was very, very slow. And I, was passed around all of these specialists trying to figure out what was going on, which definitely internalized some feelings of shame and just like, why am I this weirdo? Why can't I be normal? Um, any teenage girl feels was just exacerbated by those health issues. And then it just spiraled into like eating disorder territory again, trying to control things because I felt very out of control of symptoms and from there breaking a lot of systems in my body, I would say from, you know, blood sugar regulation uh, to I had horrible hypothyroidism, huge rebound weight gain, a massive brain fog to the point of not being able to drive or really do much. I'd sleep for 14 hours a night. And and before I was a horrible insomniac and then obviously just things <laughs> broke. And I, I went through the, the other side and just became zombie-like. And it really got to a point that I mean, I'd been to all of these doctors and I, I started looking at specialists. I um, changed my whole environment. I actually moved from, I was living in London after I graduated, moved to Vancouver again, running away, trying to control things, but I was completely out of control of everything and tried alternative th th therapies, like acupuncture, did get some relief uh, and at least some understanding of more systems in the body and how they could be connected. And my education, my, my university degree was actually a master's in chemistry, which I did because I found chemistry fascinating. I specialized in physical chemistry. We were just talking about it before we started. And uh, I just found the energy dynamics really fascinating and understanding how everything worked. And so that degree had been completely useless in my first job. Nobody really needed it. And so I, I actually put it to use researching. I went down a lot of rabbit holes trying to figure out all the different systems in the body. So you know, I started with digestion and then looked at like, what are the adrenals doing and how does the brain work? And then kind of got into psychology. I really got into functional medicine because I loved that it went to the root of the issue and just all of my own research, uh, but deep into scientific papers and, and really trying to connect everything. And my conclusion was that my nervous system was just massively dysregulated and probably had been since I was very, very young, which had led to these digestive issues and then everything uh, beyond that just got in this big vicious cycle and I hadn't been able to break it and nobody had informed me that I had a nervous system or like what it did <laughs> that it was important and I feel like that is a missing piece in the, the medical puzzle 
And I started to see people with very similar symptoms, it, common symptoms of, we call it sympathetic dominance. So when you're stuck in that chronically activated fight, flight, freeze, fall and response because of a threat that your brain is perceiving, it could be real or, or otherwise. Uh, and then when we're in that, it's almost like being in high gear for a really long time. Obviously high gear is fine as long as you're coming back and recovering from it and then going back into that high gear, coming back and recovering from it. But if you're just in this chronically activated uh, threat response, things start to break. And, and the most common symptoms we see are digestive issues, sleep issues, hormonal imbalance, uh, postural issues like, like chronic tightness and back shoulders, calves. Um, cognitive impairment, which can be brain fog, but also like losing executive function and having a lot of reactivity. And then it can spiral into additional uh, issues. And so, yeah. Autoimmune, I, just, I imagine. Yeah, autoimmune's a, a big one. And and so I just, just, just went to town <laughs> looking into all of these areas. And I realized, wow, it's like such a vast um, amount of information because it really encompasses everything from the gut biome to you know to how like our psychological state and like overworking are we actually overtraining what's in our environment like with regards to toxic chemicals how that's having an impact on the body what we eat how that's affecting our blood sugar regulation uh, and feeding our gut biome and all of the rest are there parasites are there heavy metals it's just it's it's a lot of pieces and really if one thing is off, then it can throw everything else off. And so I actually was able to work on everything. It was not an overnight <laughs> procedure. I, I tried all sorts of different modalities. And again, it was just this long phase of research. But I would say I definitely did hit that bottom. <laughs> it was a pretty hard bottom. And when was it, that in time? Like what year approximately? I mean, I would say there were various bumps, but I, probably the worst was like my early 20s, sort of 20, when I was 24, 25, uh, so it's mm -hmm. 10 years ago now. And it took some time to come out of that and undo a lot of the damage. And I can happily say I'm the happiest and feel the healthiest and strongest I've ever been in my life right now. And I do continue these practices. It's not just sort of a, let's do this and I'm fine and I'm good. It's more obviously switching lifestyle habits and mindset habits. And so you were asking at the beginning, so how I ended up <laughs> coming down to Mexico. And so I, I did run away to Vancouver, Canada for really no reason other than I liked the mountains and felt like running away was a good idea at the time. But I was trying to figure out what I was doing and I had to keep applying for a work visa because I'm from England originally. And the final year I was there, I was there for four years, there was some shift in the government and some shift in the processing of visas and my visa ended up being delayed. There was this mm. gap of about five months where I couldn't legally live in Canada. So I was trying to stay on the same time zone. And that is, <laughs> just looking at the map, <laughs> like, well, I could, I could go down to Mexico. Being in Europe would be really hard. It's eight hours ahead. And so that's how I ended up in Mexico, but it, it really changed the course of my life. And I think it was such an incredible teacher because there's such a different pace of life here. And I really embodied that um, hyper-productive, like always producing yeah. and achieving. And that's kind of where we get recognition from. Uh, I know that's what I've been just trained in my whole school career and also in, in my jobs. And so being in Mexico and just seeing how so many people can not really have much at all, but be so happy and so family focused, so community focused, you know, just having their carne asada on a Sunday and just playing their music and having a great time. And obviously this no perfect place and there's issues but it was just a great change in tempo for me and like yeah. a great therapy and you can't be that type a rush everything get it all it just doesn't work it doesn't do you ever think stuff like that know, comes into your path like the um the the visa hiccup we'll call it right where yeah. you couldn't follow your plan do you ever get the impression that that's by some kind of divine design like there's some kind of like weird underpinning to the universe that we can't see where these little twists and turns get thrown yeah. in our path. But it's not to say there's a, a conscious being that's doing it, but it's like part of the fabric somehow. I do think about it a lot. And I always, I have a little phrase I say, which is clues from the universe. It was like these things that I've kind of put, and it's very hard to tell if it means anything. Obviously I've got this sort of scientific 
something like that. It could just be perfectly random mm -hmm. randomness, you know, that just happened to coincide. Uh, but I think it is nice to to think that there are certain things when we're really in tune or going in a direction that's more, I guess, authentic to us or like we, we really get to understand ourselves. Self-mastery is a word I like of the sense of just really understanding how our brains and our bodies work, how we can create more coherence between the two. And um, when we're not sort of living based on everything society is telling us, uh, you know, you can still form part of society, but like just, we're like living a bit more on, on our own terms. And I do feel that was like running away period. It, it did give me that opportunity. And, and from that, I was able to kind of really create a bubble in this world and this life that very much reflects all of the things I learn and, and is leading me in a direction. And I do have a lot of those moments where it's like, wow, this is like too much synchronicity. Or, yeah. like, obviously our brains are these master storytellers, so we can create a story around anything. But you know, it's nice, even if it's not true. It's like nice to think that's going in the direction. Um, and I think we know, and this is something we do on the, our, our programs is the heart rate variability training, where you're basically syncing up your brain and your heart. And there's a lot of neurons in the heart, same with the gut. And so being able to be more in tune with that, I think we become so focused on being in our heads. You know, it's our tool in this day and age is working with our brains. That's well, finding thing. out that 90 something percent of our serotonin is produced in our gut, like yeah. level, took my legs out from underneath me. It's like, wait a second. Yeah. So and this gut feeling that's... concept is maybe not so much just a, you know, idiom. There's like a, yeah. there's a lot of biochemistry involved in our bodies that we are so ignorant to in the West. Yes. And constantly discovering, I feel like we're just scratching the surface on a lot of things, especially with the brain. It's such a complex organ and, and this is science, right? We just constantly realize everything we believed before wasn't true. And again, with our programs, it's like, this is what we think right now. <laughs> We're not like dogmatic right. and this is how it has to be. I'm sure there'll be further evidence to prove that of actually there's other things even better. But yeah, the gut, the gut is absolutely fascinating. It's something I could dive into for forever. It's just how much impact it has on our mood on our cognitive function, our immune system, our just general well-being, and obviously digestion. And mm -hmm just how that symbiotic relationship we have with the bacteria and even parasites that it's it's the, this incredible dance and we're just starting to understand how, like the impact of it and how we can cultivate something that works even more in our favor and i think that, yeah, I, I love the word art of of like that 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 art of like health where it's not being so dogmatic about these different you know have to do this have to do this it's sort of finding the flow of it and we don't we don't really know we don't really know. We're still just figuring it out. But there is a really fascinating field of psychobiotics, if you haven't heard about it. It's about not heard it. different strains of bacteria in the microbiome and their effect they have on cognitive function and general mood like that, because the gut and the brain are connected via the vagus nerve. So mm -hmm. it's like a very much two-way street. If we're dealing with huge amounts of mental stress and worry, it's going to have an impact on the composition of our biome. And like Never mind the fact we spent decades just shoveling antibiotics into our mouths to yeah. you know, prophylactically yeah. treat what might be, you know, an infection of some kind. I think it destroyed like two generations worth of guts. Yeah. And I mean, antibiotics obviously have their place when it's life and death and there's no other yeah, way around it. But then yeah, it, it, there's crazy. If you situation. get in a car accident, don't get in an ice <laughs> bath, go to the hospital, right? Like <laughs> yeah. modern medicine has its place, no doubt. It's yeah, absolutely. But then there's crazy statistics that I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like um, every course of anti antibiotics, it increases your chances of depression um, by, I think it's about 16% with one course, but then it, it like triples with two courses of antibiotics. Again, because you're kind of putting that nuclear bomb in, in the gut and getting rid of the good stuff too. And so, yeah, the more we can become snipers in the sense of trying mm -hmm. to get rid of the, but, and I'm sure, I'm sure our science will improve on that front too. Uh, we're still just figuring it out, but antibiotics have been the biggest boost to human longevity, really, in modern medicine. We haven't created anything comparable. Well, it's a really interesting dichotomy, right? We've we've increased longevity, yeah. but we also have increased mental illness, 
and mass shootings and like all these other things have, yeah. and I'm not blaming, by the way, just to be clear to everybody listening, I'm not yeah. blaming mass shootings yeah. on antibiotics. What I'm saying yeah. is there's been a lot of progress in the modern world, but then there's also been almost as much requisite suffering increase. And, and it causes me to wonder, is it possible to increase one without the other? Or does the yin yang of the universe sort of demand that increase? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think also just mental health just starting to come to the forefront. I think COVID helped. And a lot of big uh, events like war and, and pandemics, they, they can push advances in certain areas. And, but I think it did bring to the forefront the, the need for us to really take mental health seriously and have better measures and, and tools to, to deal with it. And actually we have a foundation. We started a foundation to offer programs for free to frontline workers, uh, which oh, nice. highlighted during the pandemic, how vital they are. And then also how much stress and pressure they're under every day. They're putting themselves in that high gear, right? That's their job right. is to be in this incredibly stressful, high pressurized life death, sometimes environment. And, and they see a lot of traumatic stuff huge amount of trauma, whether you know, primary or secondary, and, and they don't tend to get a lot of tools to be able to process that because I don't feel as a society we've really recognized it or decided actually these are the best ways to deal with it aside from counseling and talking about it. And we were just talking about somatic, that somatic experiencing processing, and I think there's a limit to what we can process with the rational mind. And this is a piece that maybe there isn't quite enough evidence for again we like to be very science-based because that is what is respected but I think science has its limits and what it understands and it doesn't negate that there are other options we just maybe can't measure it or like fully understand it but being able to process more somatically has been really really helpful for the frontline workers that we've worked with and, and somatically is meaning that it's what's stored in, in the body or the subconscious and um, often we'll see as uh, physical manifestations of repressed mental mm -hmm. incidents or emotions. And so being able to process that, um, at least even in combination, because you don't always verbalize what's happened. Uh, right. And sometimes it can just be more re-traumatizing. Your brain sometimes locks it away, right? It segments it off where you don't even realize that it happened. Yeah, your brain's always trying my to... own life, it's had like severely traumatic incidents where for decades they they completely forgot about it. And when you were processing those, did you have the imagery again or did it just feel like you were able to almost let it go? I've experienced several different layers of that. My very first somatic energy release, I got themes. It wasn't like a replay, yeah. but it was like bullet points. Um, I've had other experiences where I felt like I was there again. Yeah. And it was very heart opening. Like those experiences were very emotional. Um, and it usually involved forgiveness either to other people or myself. And then I've had experiences where it almost, if somebody walked by, you would have thought I was having a seizure where it was completely somatic. And I had no idea what it was from. I couldn't have possibly told you what it was related to. So I'd say I've, I've experienced a pretty broad spectrum on them. Yeah, it, it's really fascinating. And this is something I want to dive more into in the future is really understanding that subconscious piece. And this is what we're seeing with psychedelic therapy, like plant medicine therapy is, is it tends to tap into kind of this portal into the subconscious that we don't have access to in a, our, our regular waking state uh, or limited access. And again, the brain's just trying to keep us alive, right? That's its goal right. and it's really good at it. Uh, it's it's how we survived and became the dominant species. We have incredible brains, but it does tend to be very threat focused and it will often sort of compartmentalize and put things in a box, especially when we're younger in childhood, because we don't have a way of processing it or no map. Fully understanding it. And so it becomes the coping mechanism. And that's definitely something we see on the programs is a lot of guests won't even realize what was stored in there. It, it's just been so buried and it's like, you know, we just don't open that box until they're in an environment where they feel sufficiently safe. And safe exactly. is such an important word. It, it's being able to be in an environment that creates that uh, sense of safety for the body to be actually be able to release uh, is probably one of the key parts when we're looking at any kind of somatic processing. 
But something that our guests have found really helpful is, um, well, I mean, breathwork's another, it can be a big somatic release, uh, especially when you go to holotropic breathwork, is uh, t- it's called tension release exercises. I think it used to be called trauma release exercises, TRE. Have you ever tried it? I'm not sure. I've yeah, done a bunch of stuff sort of colloquially that I may not even know the yeah. label for. It kind of taps into, like, it, it, similar to somatic experiencing. It, basically, it was designed, um, I'm forgetting the doctor's name who who created it, but he worked in war zones and seen how um, often children, especially animals, they would like shake, sometimes adults would shake when there'd been a traumatic event. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the body's natural mechanism for releasing adrenaline. And if we're not, we don't kind of fully complete that cycle of releasing adrenaline after a traumatic event and processing it, then it tends to be stored somewhere in the body. Yep. And so he created a method. It's similar to similar, similar to very gentle yoga stretching exercises, focusing a lot on the like psoas and torso. And um, it you stretch, you you can work the muscles in a certain way, and then you'll start to shake. Most people start to shake, and it can be a really big release. And it's it's fascinating. It's something very simple. And so many, anybody can do it, any age mobility. And it's been really helpful for a lot of our guests to be able to just release. They don't even know what they're releasing. They just feel like yeah. they're releasing that weight. You know, they don't necessarily have any kind of visual or, you know, uh, actual memory that's specifically being released. But we do store and, and so we're carrying around this load of who knows what, right, <laughs> from when. And, and again, our brains, you know, we can have those really acute traumatic incidents um which can be like very obvious but then there's also a lot of incidents that you know at the time may have seemed very traumatic uh, you know a lot can be around attachment with our caregivers and mm-hmm. what we perceive to be attachment. yeah and so a lot of that can be stored and so i think it's uh it's really great you were able to go through that process too and and Feel that and I do a lot of yoga and I have had those experiences both with yeah. a combination of the yoga itself and um, and it's usually been around midsection and hips yeah. um, where I get the most and the more breath work I'm doing it definitely has the propensity for uh, increasing the amount of release involved. Like I'll find myself sometimes I'm just in Shavasana and I'm just crying and I have no idea why. Yeah. No release. But it's great now that I'm on the other side of like the masculine terror that I was raised in, in the eighties where like any sense of emotion showing meant that you were a fag and that you were like, and that was just, you know, I mean, to be fair, it was at a time when AIDS was a problem and people were dying left and right. So that was, I yeah. appreciate how some of that got planted, but like the damage that it did in the male psyche yeah. in my generation was really bad. Um, but you mentioned guests several times and I yes. totally derailed you from finishing the story of, okay, so you're on the West Coast, you've made it to Mexico. Now what happens? What, where did you, where did you land? What did you start doing for work? Yeah. I mean, it's a long tangled web of a story, but (laughs) the short version is I was working remotely for a company in Canada. uh, And then I actually started a retreat company that still, still runs in the town of Puerto Vallarta. That's where um, I was staying. That was actually with, with an ex who still runs it. And um, it was during that time I realized how powerful it was to have the group format. Uh, and how important the connection and co-regulation piece is between Interesting. something that we're really, really lacking. And I'd never really been on a retreat. It's a, kind of a long story how we ended up doing that. But um, we were running mostly yoga retreats. You and- started a retreat company before you'd been yeah. on a retreat. Yes, we <laughs> did. But, I mean, it worked. And it was popular. And it still runs to this day. We started that in 2016. And um, so that just really showed me how powerful it is to step away from your everyday life you can like leave a persona behind and to be around even with a group of strangers how much connection and bonding you can create in quite a short period of time and I exited that company for various reasons but a big one was that I was I was kind of in my I, I was just kind of at the end of my own transformation period and all of these things that I'd learned and the modalities I tried I just wanted to share that it had been really really transformational for me and I'd kind of piecing all of the parts together. And I realized that 
it was so important to look at the whole picture. So just like we're saying there, that kind of physical somatic. So I wanted to put together a program that was focused on the nervous system. I felt like no one was talking about the nervous system, especially back then. Now it's become a bit more mainstream, which is great. But um, no one even really like knew what was going on with it. Like why, why would they care about it? And um, I wanted it to look at the physical, the mental, the emotional, the nutritional, and the existential factors that affect the nervous system. Because what I noticed in a lot of these retreat programs and just generally going to any kind of practitioner was it, it seemed to just hit one or two of those uh, and not all of them at the same time. And so I, it, it took me a bit of time. Um, I started in 2018. I kind of set off solo with nothing <laughs> to do this project. And it took a while to build momentum and even just like enough funding for me to, I'm self-funded um, through other um, bits and pieces I was doing to be able to start the programs. And so I started it and I was inviting down different specialists in different areas, you know, like functional medicine doctors, neurofeedback specialists, and then COVID hit. So it looked like that was the end of it all. Uh, it looked like tourism was over and nobody was traveling. Uh, and fortunately, I happened to be in Mexico, which was one of, I think, four countries that kept its border open. And wow. our tourism bounced back pretty quick because everybody wanted to be in the freest country in the world, which was Mexico. And it was at that point I, I realized I had a great opportunity to launch a longer format program because these are things that don't just happen overnight. You know, you can, you can do a lot in a short period of time or at least educate, but to have the reinforcement. You can wake somebody up, but to really go through the yeah. process. Yeah. It's kind of that process of neuroplasticity. You need the impetus, the trigger, and then consistency to reinforce those habits and build the neural connections. And so the first program was actually 28 days. And I people would come because if they were going to go through the pain of traveling through COVID, they right. probably want to actually stay a chunk of time. Everyone could work remotely and it's completely sold out. And I wasn't even really fully prepared for it to sell out, <laughs> but we, we did it and it was such an incredible experience. Um, like just, I think also we, in general, people have been quite isolated because of COVID. So coming together felt even more impactful and then all of the tools that they learned, we could really see the transformations in the guests. And we were all just like in tears of like joy at the end. Uh, it was really beautiful. I had a very skeleton staff for this retreat, but we decided, okay, like this has to keep going. Like we want to keep doing this. And so it just became a case of sort of on the job learning business and how to you know get, get to where we are now. Uh, and so, yeah, we just, we just kept going. We <laughs> just like, kept getting what knocked down. What are the yeah. So some like, retreats, like what are the, what are the highlights or what are the themes of the things that people will be doing? Yeah. And so just as a, uh, to free face it, we don't do the 28 days anymore. That was very COVID specific. <laughs> we did do 21 and then uh, now we focus more on five and 10 day programs. Again, we want to make it accessible for people who just, they can't work remotely or they can't take that chunk of time. And especially, you know, like moms or kids and people with responsibilities and, and all of the rest. And so um, we, so it depends on the program, but I would say the, again, because we're looking at all of those different factors, we have quite a, a, a mixed, like a multimodal program. So we do everything from brain mapping. We take a QEG brain map to measure electrical activity in 19 different parts of the brain, which then directs our neurofeedback sessions. We focus more on neuromeditation, which is basically giving real-time feedback while measuring the brain waves to um, train the brain on when it's hitting those meditative states. And that's just something that's quite helpful because we don't have a really long period of time, but it can really help guests to understand that state of meditation with disruptor, dis disruptors instead of just sitting for 20 odd minutes thinking about your to-do list and all of the rest like I did at the beginning of my meditation journey. Um, and then we also do like heart rate variability training. We have a you know, workshop that explains why it's important, how to do it, how to incorporate it into your day. Um, and these our big goal is to give sort of tools that can be incorporated very easily, even into the busiest of days. It's hard for someone to go back and just change their whole life. Yeah. Um, but these are quite practical things. We serve an anti-inflammatory menu via a buffet three times a day, which is always a hit. And so it's based more on the paleo diet, you know, gluten, mm -hmm. dairy, refined seed oils, you know, corn, soy, but it's really delicious. And um, we have lots of requests for a cookbook. Um, we do movement every day, uh, some rest days, but the, they do uh, functional movement for mobility. We do movement for neuro performance, doing a lot of like crossing over the body and 
um, working on and switching between the different hemispheres and creating more coordination of yoga and um, some resistance training, building up the mitochondria and muscle. Uh, we do, we have um, uh, photobiomodulation, the red light therapy and infrared and uh, PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic frequencies, just more to relax. Um, a big piece is the education piece. So we, we combine education with more immersive experiences. So our education they include workshops on all sorts of themes from sympathetic dominance, which is our main focus of the retreat. Like what happens when we're in this overactivated, chronically activated, sympathetic uh, branch of the nervous system activated state, uh, which is our fight, flight, freeze response. How can we get more into that parasympathetic state, which is our relaxation, digestion and healing response. So just really understanding that system and how we can control it and not just be at the whim of it, um, as well as um, like integrating, how do we integrate all of this into our life? Uh, principles for nutrition for our general health and also mental health and we do a full gut protocol so it's a three-phase protocol to help get rid of some of those pathogenic bacteria bacteria that aren't helping us in any way and parasites that we don't want in there uh, to heal the gut lining and then to also repopulate and reseed the the gut to encourage the growth of beneficial bacteria uh, and again going down that route with psychobiotics how do we cultivate those um, bacteria that are going to have a positive effect on cognitive function and our mood, you know, lowering anxiety, depression. And I mean, it goes on. We have immersive experiences like we do, we do cold thermogenesis and ice bath. Uh, we do it a little bit different and we focus more on the emotional piece uh, and how we can sort of sit in discomfort and then also use it to release emotions or so more of a somatic release uh, as well as that nice dopamine hit afterwards. And we do breath work and also a Temescal ceremony. So uh, we were talking a bit about um, the more kind of spiritual side. We're, we're, we're not a spiritual focus retreat. Any, literally anybody's welcome from any age. We've had from 18 to 85 to come on the retreat, all mobilities, all like male, female, all religions, uh, anything. Like we were so, it applies to everybody. But um, what we uh, do like to do is we, we combine that scientific basis and how it can uh, apply to i guess metaphysical is maybe the word of just when we're looking at existential themes how we exist among something bigger and really like cultivating practices whether it's gratitude compassion meditation which we can do in more of a scientific basis and actually see what's happening to the nervous system in real time when we're in those states and one of those things is a tamaskal uh, ceremony which is a traditional sweat lodge here from the indigenous cultures here in in mexico north america we do a version that's from this area and uh, that can lead to some really big insights and um visions even a lot of our guests have had and so yeah i'm sure there's more i'm, I'm missing i mean we do, we do everything from cooking classes and arts and crafts which just get the brain into a, a lower gear and again, the whole experience is just designed around really understanding the brain and body better, creating more coherence, that self-mastery piece of if, when you more understand your system, you're not in resistance. Uh, you're, right. you're not fighting against it. You can work with it and it can work for you. And a big, big theme that comes up are these emotional, repressed emotional issues. They just, I guess, have no idea that they're there. Or they might know that they're there, but it's linked to something completely different. And the existential piece and then probably one of the biggest takeaways is how important connection is. You know, sitting down and eating together every day and just spending time going through challenges together, supporting each other. And I would say the group dynamics, one of the pieces most people fear before coming down. I'm not sure if you just, I mean, myself included, I would probably be like that too. Like, oh, I feel like be in a group. But it's when you watch it, it's so beautiful. And the connections that are formed are, are really strong. And a lot of our guests stay in touch well, with us and with the other guests afterwards uh, for a long time. And we're still in touch with our very first group, <laughs> the, the prototype group. And it's, it's great just to see how they are able to integrate the different themes and what changes they're able to make. It's been a, a very rewarding process. First of all, wow. That <laughs> sounds <love> incredible. <laughs> I am going to start negotiating with my wife when uh, we're each going to take turns coming down. Um, so many, so many comments and so many questions. Let me just 
piggyback off the last thing you said, which is this notion of kind of community. I think one of the most tragic things that's occurred in the last hundred years has been the dissolution of that notion, right? Like if you look at Latin culture, Asian culture, you have, even if you just look at the family, you have multiple generations of people living under the same roof or at worst roof next to roof. And you've got your religious community. You've just got so much where everybody is sort of leaning on each other. And I obviously didn't grow up. Well, I don't know if it's obvious or not. Surprise. I didn't grow up in Great Britain, but I presume it was very similar to the U.S. and Canada where it feels like everything has been atomized. And it's all about this notion of individual success. And it's almost like if you do lean on other people, you can't take enough credit because you didn't do it on your own. And, right. Right. It's yeah. like the, the it's like a a shame factor of like, well, I don't want to ask for help because then, you know, I'm putting them out and it in I'm now in debt to them. And it's just like this whole system <laughs> seemed to get flipped upside down. So I love that a huge part of your program addresses that maybe almost accidentally. Right. I don't know that that was necessarily something you decided on purpose or if it just happened to come out that way. Yeah, it really was seeing those groups in the original retreat company, but I underestimated how important it would be for the guests. I felt, you know, oh, we have all these modalities and you know, they, we don't just throw the modalities out there. They're, they're very much um, we have a progressive program and they work together synergistically. So that has its own part. But I, I think both are important because even just to be able to connect with other humans, it's, we have to be in a certain nervous system state. Uh, if we're kind of getting towards this like shutdown state, we don't we don't want to connect. I'm sure we've all felt right. that. I've felt that for sure. <laughs> so if you're interested. massively anxious or depressed, you just want yeah. to lock yourself in a room. And that like social anxiety piece, which I feel has gone up a lot. And maybe mm-hmm. it's because of just that culture that has promoted it of being used to being very hyper dependent, sorry, independent and yeah, that's, it, I'm not sure if it's competitive, but it's just that lens of it kind of like producing, and, you know, best job, you might be competing against other people in your jobs. It's just, it doesn't. Yeah, us versus them, right? Yeah. Which is really me versus the world. Right. And yeah, I definitely didn't grow up with anything like this. And I grew up in a small village, uh, which probably helps compared to a city. And I do remember being young and it felt a little bit more like here in Mexico, but it definitely dissolved and we don't see it anymore at all. At some point that kind of just like ended and definitely going out into the working world, it, it doesn't, or you know, you move to a new city, it's quite hard to find that community. And that's a, a big thing that we hear from guests. It's like, it's hard for me to find the people like my communities or my tribe, my people that I, I want to spend time with or are going to support me in this. And, and that can definitely be challenging once they've kind of expanded and learned a lot on the retreats to then go back into their environment. The people that are in there, maybe that now doesn't really fit as well. But yeah, definitely for the, the family piece. And it, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. what happened. But it's, it's beautiful to watch here. Uh, and again, I think there's sort of this balance. Sometimes that can hold people back. You know, they only want to stay in their village, you know, yeah, yeah. born in their village, stay in their village, die in the village. And I do think the sort of hero's journey of kind of going off and learning things and bringing that back can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Um, I think it, it sort of kills ambition. I don't see a lot of ambition in that environment. Uh, is that a bad thing? I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it depends what we're measuring. I get but- under the impression the more I get into the existential side, the mystical side, the you know, call it mythical side that there is no good and bad. Yeah. And the hero's journey is the most interesting way to live a life. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want to maximize, it's not even about, in fact, you could argue it's antithetical to personal enjoyment. Mm -hmm in some ways, right? Because going into the dragon's den when you are armorless and without a torch in a lot of times, right? 
to gain that knowledge to take it back to the tribe. You don't real you don't even necessarily realize what you're doing, right? Like when you when you started on this path, I would be absolutely flabbergasted if you had like a 30 year plan and you plotted out exactly how it was all going to go and it was going to be for the greater good. Right? Sometimes we find ourselves plotting just one step at a time, but it's simply the courage to do the thing that is scary. I think for my case, it was I had nothing to lose too, which is a very powerful position to be in. <laughs> like you're yeah. already kind of down and out, so there's not much to lose. Uh, and the alternative seems so grim like, that it's better to keep yeah. going. But that's, and I think that one of the most dangerous positions is to be incredibly comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, or, or just slightly uncomfortable in that like too comfortable situation. Uh, I was very uncomfortable, so I had to do something about it. But I do see a lot of people in that situation where they. It's like, it's just enough, but you know, they're not fulfilled or pushed and they're not growing. Uh, but well, yeah, I think I, a lot of that's because we've medicated people into sentiment. numbness, right? With yeah. the SSRIs and antipsychotics and anti-anxiety and alcohol and marijuana. Marijuana can be an amazing tool. It absolutely transformed my life yeah. until it was preventing me from living life, right? Like everything, right. the difference between poison and medicine is the dose. Yeah, and also, yeah, and what you're using it for, right? Uh, if we're just right. numbing, then we're clearly just running away from something. And I, yeah, I think the big question too is also, does it matter if you're just, if you're living in a village with your family and you know, you're know you very, have a beautiful life serving your family and doing all these things, that's a great life. You know, you don't necessarily have to go out and discover something new or <laughs> do you know you, you can you can also have a lot of, of personal growth within uh, a space like that uh, and so I think yeah everybody has their own journeys I think it's just that piece of understanding ourselves more and and how many decisions are made from fear versus yes. a, a numbing and running away and like how, which is kind of betraying ourselves right it, kind of, it taps into the self love piece and this is the bit i love where you can truly see it in the science and it connects fully with pretty much every um traditional um spiritual practice religion is how much can we develop self-love and really all of our modalities are heading towards that because what they're doing is just looking at each layer that's blocking that and we all have something right no matter what we i don't think anyone has that perfect self-love uh, unless they're i don't know maybe the monks Maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> there's there's always these things that will cover it, and so no matter you know whatever you're doing in your life, whether you're running the Fortune 500 company or a fisherman on the beach in Mexico, like the more we can work on that, the just the, the better we're going to be for ourselves and everyone around us, right? It's how. Yeah, I think you nailed it with the idea of what am I built for, right? Like my grandmother on the paternal side is the closest thing to a living angel that I can imagine. Like she's so grateful. She's so loving. She's so peaceful, but she hasn't been out of the country and she's never stood on stage and she didn't start a company, right? Like she, there's so many things she quote unquote didn't do, but she lived the life I think she was built for and brought love to the people around her. And yeah. that was her journey and her story. So to your point, like not everybody has to be Jesus Christ or Buddha, right? Like it doesn't have to be this big grand arc. Yeah. But if you're tormented and you know if you are, the answer behind what are you not doing? What are you afraid to let go of? What are you afraid to leap towards? To me, that's like the gap of your real, like what you're quote unquote meant to be, that gap creates all that neurological disorder as an adult. As a child, it's created because it's imbued upon you, right? You are in an environment you can't control and everything is thrumming. And the delta between what you're able to experience and what actually happened gets stored. Yeah. And now you're just vibrating for, you know, potentially decades. But once you get into adulthood and you start having these choices in front of you, I feel like the gap between what you're 
quote unquote meant to do, what you're built for and what you actually do, that suddenly gets stored and takes on a whole new energetic resonance. Because the part of our subconscious knows that we're afraid. Whether we're afraid to be still or we're afraid to take a risk. So this notion of the mind, body, spirit connection, all these different things, it feels like it's getting a lot of airtime in uh, places like the Joe Rogan experience, hosting folks like Gabor Mate, for instance. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a, who's selling millions of books. At least I presume he's selling millions. He's selling a lot of books. Maybe yeah. it's hundreds of thousands. I think it's millions. Totally. And there's other people like him, obviously. I'm just naming him because I think he's a really popular one. The gap between what seems to have been intellectualized as like what has happened to us mm -hmm. and some of the things that you could think about doing and then the actual practical application of that, that gap seems so wide to me. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that has not, like, what you're doing is so important. Why do you think more people have not stepped into that space? Great question. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I made, I made this because I felt it didn't exist. And this is what I wanted, reason for starting something. but. I think, I think we're just kind of getting there. I think we're just figuring it out. Um, and maybe when we're getting onto, for example, in the US to be covered by insurance, for example, you have to kind of meet certain criteria and a lot of this might be kind of a bit gray area still. Mm. And hopefully that does progress. Uh, for example, I mean, the, the, the <laughs> mission of the company, which I don't actually write on the website because I thought people would just think, is um is to help people find freedom and joy and it just kind of goes back to your point before of, like we know this there's like this sort of like mental prison that's being created and there could be physical symptoms Ten the physical symptoms tend to be the manifestation of the repressed emotional right so just like you're saying if someone's got those fears or they're running away from something they're numbing something it will express in some way it might express in rage it might express in the treatment of other people or those around them uh, it could also be more um internal it can manifest in certain symptoms i mean even dr government mate made the connection to for example breast cancer um tend to be people who are like total people pleasers mm -hmm. and there's like quite a distinct connect but i feel like the only real approved treatment for most things that are in the mental health realm are sort of counseling therapy which like we just said are, are quite limited and the rest, I mean, you know, neurofeedback's been around since like, what, the 60s or maybe before. It's not the solution. I don't think it by itself it's the solution. And again, I think this is where we fall into a trap is the way the medical system works right now is, okay, I have this issue. This is a solution, you know, whether it's right. pill, the surgery. One-to-one the -one type fall. of. Yeah. Whereas I think this is such a, it's like a, a personal, but also like a cultural, societal uh, problem obviously we can do our best to improve our internal environment amongst the external environment, which is a big piece that we teach, for example, for our frontline workers, they're not changing their environment. They're not making the, the hospital suddenly this like blissful, tranquil, calm environment. This is not going to happen. They chose this career and you know, how can they best regulate their internal environment? And again, a big piece that they would tell us is that they just didn't think about all of the other things. Um, okay. You know, they know, certain stress management techniques but they didn't think about like all of those five and how they're being processed or that it's not it's not just talking about it and that's almost like a luxury for example in a fire department to have a therapist work with the firefighter and they don't they also a, a big piece that we we're hear from them is that they they felt shame around needing to talk about it or not being able to process trauma very well because they chose that profession. They knew what they were getting into. Also, for example, firefighters, they, do, they are predominantly men. And they just, you know, I'm strong and fine. They're I certainly masculine, regardless yeah. of sex. And so, and so it, that's a big societal piece, um, just like you were mentioning, you know, growing up in the 80s and being programmed in that way. We see that a lot. And I mentioned before we started this, uh, the men who come down on our programs have the biggest transformations out of everyone. And I think they choose their programs because it is science-based. They don't feel like they're in 
going to be in like a circle wearing white singing or something, you know, like on a typical kind of like spiritual retreat. And so I think it's like bridging that gap between um, really well, a lot of these modalities that we use, they're already accepted. And um, mm -hmm. actually I think like insurance covers quite a lot of them in the US, for example. But I think it's the way they're put together <laughs> Uh, and the kind of combined education and then practical use of them and then really understanding like going deeper beyond the rational mind has been very important. And I, that piece, I don't see that really happening. For example, if somebody goes to their uh, primary care physician, if they're, if they're dealing with, say, extreme anxiety, I don't think that's what they're going to be prescribed is to, you know, right. let's look more into your like subconscious and these emotional issues. It'll be like therapy potentially, most, most probably a medication to numb it. Yeah. And, and so, and also I, I think we're potentially the only retreat focused on nervous system regulation <laughs> still, there might've been some pop up when I first started it, there was nothing out there, but we've actually had people start to find us on Google by searching for that which we never yeah, ever thought anybody would uh, or even think that that would exist. And so I think that's a good sign that because this information is starting to reach the mainstream, a lot of people are realizing that they, okay, they're like, okay, there's more to this. I want to learn more about it. I want to try these different modalities. How do I do that? And it's quite hard to put all of the pieces together yourself, especially amongst a very busy life and to try and find them and try and understand the practitioners. And again, I think that piece of, being around others who are dealing with very similar things, potentially completely different professions and outwardly looking, you know, so different, different ages. But there is that common humanity piece of we're mostly dealing with the same things. It's just the, the case for being human and how that can then be addressed. But yeah, I, I'd love to see. I, I think it's great that this is starting to become more mainstream, so I'm sure we will see more. Um, was it uh, Dr. Um, Oh, I'm forgetting his name all of the names today. Uh, he wrote Body Keeps the Score. Van, Van, de, Van de Kolk, I think his name is. Yes. Uh, Bessel, Bessel Van de Kolk. <laughs> he, um, he addressed a lot of these themes. And I mean, he's been in the trauma-informed therapy space for a long time. And so I really thought from there... was the first book that I read that helped me understand that there was an emotion, <laughs> an emotional linkage with like what is going on in the body. I, think I read that book and I was like, whoa, I mean, it completely blew my mind. And what's yeah. interesting is, you know, you talk about the neural, I remember it was neural system regulation, the way that you described your, your center, what people were searching for. There's so many different modalities that I think are playing on that, that would never use that terminology. Because mm -hmm. if you really think about what the physical practice of yoga is, that's what yeah. it is. Absolutely. If you think about what is what is Wim Hof, whether it's the ice related stuff or it's the breath work, it's the same thing, right? Even if you look at something like a acupuncture or a trigger point therapy, it's all it's Massage. all tying into yeah, exactly. It's all tying into the same concept of how do I get my body to stop doing this? <laughs> and I, I think it is that education piece of just understanding it. A, a little bit deeper, honestly, a bit, because then you can make really conscious decisions around, okay, there's no way to get rid of stress in your life. You know, there's always a deadline. There's, you know, if you have kids, there's like, <laughs> like I just take a nap today or, or you know, sleep in. Right. And so th there's always going to be stresses and we, we can't get a, <laughs> away from them. And, you know, even, I bet even the monks have stresses, like there's, there's stressors and it's more how can we respond to them? And so I think if you better understand, okay, how are these stresses affecting me? How do I understand when I'm kind of getting to a point that I'm probably going to see some repercussions from this? How can I bring myself back? And a big thing we teach is just understanding what the parasympathetic state is, which again, that's the, the branch of the nervous system responsible for digestion, relaxation, healing, recovery. And how, like understanding what that is, understanding how it feels to be in that state, and then how to get into it more often, you know, how, yeah. how can I just do that? It might just be for minutes a day, but how can I keep sending cues of safety to my body through something as simple as an extended exhale before I eat? So I digest and absorb my food better before I go to mm. sleep, which can really calm anxiety. There's great studies showing that just doing, I think it's like a minute or something like even, of, of just extended exhale 
breathing. So it could be an inhale for two counts, exhaling for four, or inhaling for four out of eight um, for a minute <laughs> before bed has shown like an increase, like a significant increase in the quality and length of sleep. I mean, anybody can do that. Everyone has a minute before bed, but it's, it's more just planting the awareness and making it more default. And that's something that I notice I do now as I'm so aware when I'm getting into that really stressed out state and I can bring myself back and I know how to calm it. Uh, and, and sometimes maybe it goes just a bit too far because it's you know, a really stressful time or this big thing happening, big project. Ups. There's some things we can't ever plan for it hits us. But how much can we get back into that recovery state? And I love comparing this to athletes. I actually studied a lot of sports science. I found it fascinating because uh, athletes always have the coolest, latest technology and we can apply it to us regular humans. And that's actually where HRV is used a lot. Um, heart rate variability training just to understand basically that because the athlete's goal is to push to pretty much the maximum when they're training mm -hmm. so that they can then recover fully and it means that they're coming back like stronger faster better if they push too far if they're just you know training 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 not fully recovering injury will happen they're just so aware right. of that and so again we can do that we can in our everyday lives push and push and push because something's going on but if it's when we don't come back and recover, that's when it goes wrong and we get injured in the form of, you know, burnout or crazy anxiety or. Well, that's how I lived my 20s and 30s, primarily <laughs> for, I'd say, at least 15 years, probably more. I was working 60 to 100 hours a week, doing all nighters, yeah. using stimulants to do that, and then using alcohol to be able to actually fall asleep. Yeah. And I didn't have any idea how chronically inflamed my entire system was. Yeah. And until several years ago when I found sensory deprivation floating, because yeah. I had done yoga and I had done several mm -hmm. things and I'd been in therapy for decades. Right. I had never been still in my entire life. Yeah. And, you know, I got um, multiple times I tried to get diagnosed with ADHD because I couldn't sit still. I, my yeah. mind was always just go constantly on fire. Now, I look back and it's like, what was my diet in high school? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it was primarily, like, I'd wake up and I'd face two enormous bowls of Lucky Charms. And then I'd get to school and I'd drink chocolate milk for lunch and I'd have nothing but carbohydrates in the afternoon and I'd drink Coca-Cola and then I'd go, you know, eat $10 worth of McDonald's, which is probably a hundred hamburgers at the time. It's like, oh my God, I, why can't I concentrate? Why can't I sit still? And it's like, well, because your body's trying to electrocute you to tell you to change what you're doing. And instead you're just rushing forward, rushing forward. I noticed that yesterday, actually, I had um, a 90 minute float. I haven't done it in a while. Um, unfortunately, the place I was going that was like five minutes from my house actually burned down um, okay. like 18 months ago. And probably 40 minutes into it, I reached the true backstop of like profound stillness where you are so relaxed. There's just no more tension held anywhere, no, not in a molecule of your body. And it's just like the level of peace that you feel when you reach that state, it's almost laughable because you're like, I can't believe the delta between what I live like day to day. And this is somebody who even does yoga and breath work and meditation. And even still, I find myself clenching. And it's almost like... If you've got the ability to live completely in the moment, right, which is probably very much what the communities are doing that you're living there, right? Where it's just, I am just here experiencing whatever's happening. And in the modern world, we are either on our tiptoes racing forward or we're back mired in the hell of something we've already experienced and just re-traumatizing ourselves about it. Mm -hmm. Because in the moment, there's nothing to worry about. You're just now. It's everything's great. We're alive. Yeah. yeah. How do you find yourself dealing with that? The 
the propensity to fall back or mm -hmm. lean forward. Yeah, well, I was going to bring up a point because I, I would really struggle to meditate or be still at all, at all. And I was just that I had more of a manic personality of just like create, do, always be me. Which I think is a coping mechanism. Uh, it definitely ties into that like hypervigilance piece where it's very mm -hmm. hard to shut down. You don't feel safe to be still. Uh, and I see that a lot. And I think it can also tie into like an addiction to adrenaline and cortisol. Mm -hmm. Where you're just so used to having adrenaline and cortisol in your body, it feels very strange not to. And like for me, when I wasn't pumped full of adrenaline, <laughs> cortisol, I just feel like, oh my God, like something's horribly wrong. And that can, I mean, that can go right back to being, uh, you know, in the womb. Uh, I know my mom had a lot of stress uh, when I was uh, in in her womb, and it, it, like, the baby feels everything. And so I was like, you know, filled with all of these hormones. Uh, not to blame my mom, obviously. She, she's always yeah, just doing the best. We're always but, all just doing our best. Yeah, but the it's just a real. I think that's a very interesting point because I. And again, I don't know if this is scientifically recognized or recognized in the medical community, but I definitely had this propensity to always, as soon as things were calm, find another reason to fill it with like more adrenaline and, you know, rush and, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> couldn't, couldn't really just like stop and have a peaceful time. And I do catch myself doing it. Uh, now I, I see it as enthusiasm and excitement, but there's quite a lot of crossover there. So I have to, and I catch myself and I was like, oh, then we can do this and then this and then this and then this. Or you can just have like a really calm day and just chill out. But I think um, my I definitely had the propensity to be very future focused. So I had more kind of like anxiety based, always mm -hmm. thinking 20 steps ahead, uh, which can be helpful in certain circumstances. I mean, for sure, running a business doesn't help with that because there's like always so many things you can be thinking about. You know, work never ends. You can be working literally from the second you wake up till you go to bed, especially we don't have like a nine till five hours. Uh, right. And a lot of the things I, I like doing, I don't really like sort of see it as work, but having some kind of boundary around that is important. Uh, I don't think I'm like the A plus student on that one, but I'm, I'm getting there. And, and, and really like setting aside time just to fully you know, rest. But again, I do feel like I have quite a good sense of sort of where my boundaries are in, in the sense of, um, like, am I really running? Am I running purely on the adrenaline here? And am I just like in that high gear where, or am I like grounded and going? And I can always tell, I can tell by how my brain's functioning too. Like those days when my, if my brain's just like foggy and weird, it's, it's because I haven't rested enough, I'm exhausted. And if I feel really clear and I can sort of articulate well, and I, I'm excited to sit down and do something that's kind of like a more thought, like thinking heavy process, then, then I know, okay, well, I'm, I'm well rested. Again, a bit like the athlete, just like really understanding. I used to use the HRV actually just to really test um, kind of where I was at and, and especially if I was going to work out. But I feel like I've become very intuitive to, to where my body is. Uh, mm. And before, again, I during my eating disorder phase, I had this huge like exercise addiction. Again, it was a way to get all of that adrenaline and cortisol. And I definitely like... <laughs> I'm nowhere near that now. I mean, I work out, but I, I just, I know the days when I just don't feel good at, or not, not good, but it's, it's like today I'm not pushing it. So, or today I'll just go right. for a walk or so I'll just sit on the beach. Uh, it doesn't have to be this constant. And I think this is, I, I've seen this a bit in the biohacking community. Uh, not putting in that. I, I really got into the biohacking thing. I found it fascinating. I was so into Tim Ferriss for a long time. And now like the, I'll call it the modern version of it's Huberman. Yes, I loved him. I loved him, Ferris. He was like my my podcasting idol for sure. And I learned so much business wise, and learned a lot from him. And I, I definitely identified with his whole bit, like obsessive about optimizing. Yeah, um, but yeah, I think I think even he, he himself at this point, based pathological on, at some point. Yeah, I, I think he's even sort of <laughs> like realized that and has gone into more of a chill mode, and 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 a more creative mode. And, you know, it's been the process, and. Yeah, I definitely see some of the biohackers. I think, you know, sure, you know, like ice baths and sort of they're great. But again, like what state are you in going into these? If you're already like working however many hours in some high pressure job and then your weekend activities are like hard workouts, ice baths, it's like a lot of activation of the sympathetic uh, system and can potentially just be leading to the burnout. And then also like, what's it for? I feel like a lot of it can be a lot of optimizing of the physical and 
you know, it's great. And I can definitely help the mental and, and a lot of other things. But then I also feel it can be like pushing limits. You know, how much can we optimize mind with all of these nootropics and things so we can focus, like, focus the most and get the most productivity. And you kind of like lose some of the joy. <laughs> you know, like the well, joy. I think it's disconnected from that whole premise of like, what are we doing here exactly? Yeah. Like, what's it for? What's, I love your, big, what's your big why? So yeah. I actually want to circle back to that premise because um, I think there's a lot of interesting ways to tie that into what you're doing and sort of where you came from. But before I forget, you mentioned hypervigilance, and I definitely experienced that for my whole life. I still do in a lot of ways. Yeah. Outside the womb, was there anything in your childhood that was like unpredictable? Like, did your parents wear two different faces and you couldn't tell? Like, do you, have you discovered sort of where that hypervigilance sort of initiated from? Yeah, I did some digging and, and I even, I did a psilocybin trip too. I thought, oh, this might give me some insight. Um, and I thought, you know, maybe there is something quite dramatic that I, my, my brain's putting in a box and I just like, I, it's not coming up. And I, I haven't, I haven't fully discovered. I mean, I definitely see characteristics in my parents that would have led me for sure into that stress state. Um, they definitely mm -hmm. both were characterized by high stress states. I think they also had their own trauma from their childhoods, which I, you know, we've talked more about now in my adult. And I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense, you know, based on, um, I definitely don't think I had like an abusive childhood or there is anything like really acute, but I think like anybody um, growing up, there they can be situations and dynamics uh, that come about again wouldn't blame my parents for it but that have led to a certain you know way of being uh but mine for sure i just i i did feel like that productivity and achievement was kind of the the love getter <laughs> in a way even if they maybe didn't actively try and do that that just seemed to be the message that i got and and it definitely picked up a perfectionism complex i would say that's probably from my dad um you know he definitely had like a critical voice, he, I would say, internalized a critical voice, and not necessarily directly at me. I would just sort of see it around, yeah, and yeah. internalize that. And so, um, yeah, it definitely led to perfectionism. And then perfectionism became a, an escape, right? That became the right. addiction, uh, and and definitely getting into that eating disorder that is an addiction. Uh, and actually, it's been shown just the literal starvation. Uh, it can it boost certain brain chemicals, and it can have a similar effect to addiction. But for me, it was control. Control was such a huge part of it. And I would say I still have certain areas. I mean, if you talk to our team, we have the most amazing team, but I'm kind of like, no, it has to be like this. It has to be like this. Um, but I, I started to like let go. <laughs> uh, and I let go in a lot of different areas. Yeah. And I, I definitely feel that now where I, I just, and I, I think that's such a huge, for me, that feels like such a huge success for me. One, before I, I, felt it, I found it really hard to feel joy, even though I had a lot of reasons for it. And I was that. Uh, yep. A stereotypical out, outwardly looked like I had everything together. It was pretty Speaking successful. My language. In school. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but inside really quite deeply broken and, and more just not happy, just couldn't feel happiness. And then felt guilty for not being happy. I would achieve it. things that I had spent years going after, whether it yeah. was making a big sale or getting a gold medal in a grappling tournament or something. I wouldn't even feel joy in the, for right. a minute, let yeah. alone the kind of like resonant halo that seems to accompany that type of thing for other people. And really? I never really even considered how broken that was. It was just like, all right, on to the next thing. Yeah. And it's a, it's not a fun state to be in. And I know my internal headspace was not a good place to be. It was a really strong negative voice. And I can happily say these days, it's a really lovely voice. It's very positive. And I can, I can just appreciate, you know, just exist and appreciate things and, 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 and kind of bask in the joy of it and really feel that, like feel that throughout my whole body. And, and what I find fascinating is when I got more into the neuroscience of things, um, I started to love neurofeedback and it was very helpful for me um, because you can kind of tie these brainwave states into the states that we're feeling, right? Um, that's mm -hmm. Basically, our brain waves are our thoughts, actions, everything. And so, if we can switch our brain waves, we can change our lives. And I definitely it helped me. And I was so stuck in these really high energy brain waves. And so, that that that's pretty common for someone who's dealing with like a high level of anxiety, 
probably that hypervigilance piece, and just generally a little bit more manic. And it was really great for me for like math and science. I was, I was like a very fast processor, but it was really hard to switch off and, you know, stop those voices at night or just, you know, really quiet it. And just like you're saying how you were able to get into the sensory deprivation tank and, and, and the flow tank and, and just sort of like let go, that can be a really hard process. And it was a very hard process for me because if you're going in with that kind of almost like neurotic mind. I'm going to win I, at this float. <laughs> yeah. And I think it can be like really, it can be dangerous. I mean, just, just, I've never said to people, just oh, go meditate, go meditate. I, I actually don't think it's that helpful unless you have some kind of disruptor or like a really good instructor that can tell when you're sort of like going in the wrong direction. It almost becomes a form of self-torture because you're sitting there <laughs> thinking to yourself, I'm doing it wrong. And you end up self-flagellating right. the whole time a lot of shame and then also potentially just reinforcing your pathways that aren't that helpful, the sort of like neurotic spin. Yeah. And so if you mean neurofeedback and things like MRA variability training, which are forms of biofeedback, were very helpful because it created a disruptor. And I was like getting feedback when I was like hitting certain states and like not. And so I was able to, amongst other things, it wasn't just I was alone, um, but just being able to understand when I was in certain states and start to train that was very helpful and now i'm much better able to get into like alpha state for example which is is we up train alpha and theta in meditation uh, that's the zen monks have really high alpha levels and theta is when you're getting into that kind of like dreamlike subconscious state and i just didn't really have access to them it was just like very hard for me to have access to those states and so being able to understand what it feels to be in that state and to be able to come back into it more frequently was really really powerful and had such a difference made a huge difference on my well-being. You know, if you're going around the world, being able to be almost like glowy and, you know, in that yeah. joyous state versus like, oh, I'm like thinking of a hundred million things, my to-do list and what's next. And does it very different experiences of life, but really with the same or better outcomes, right? Like it's not like I, I achieve less. I don't think I still get a lot of things done. I'm just not wasting so much brain energy. And I think that's a, a just an important piece for people who are struggling with meditation or they don't want to meditate it can be very helpful to try different modalities that can help get into those lower states, brain states first, or just really understanding the nervous system because it's often because we're in that sympathetic dominance in that, that activated state that we're struggling to get out of them because the body doesn't feel safe. It doesn't right. feel safe to, to be in those lower brainwave states because it wants to be hypervigilant and make sure it's producing or doing or whatever. You it's know what I think is really powerful about your story is this notion of safety. And I grew up in a situation where there was a pretty handsome amount of big T trauma mm -hmm. in terms of physical violence, a lot of yeah. mental abuse and torture. Yeah. So it's not a mystery how I ended up in the way that I did. Right. But my wife is a lot like you in that she ends up in this hypervigilant adult state with no obvious play, like no obvious source, like very, you know, quote unquote, normal childhood with like no big exposed, obvious areas. So I think it's important for people to hear that there's not something wrong with you. Like there's not some like fucked up twist of your life where you're, it's you that's broken, right? Like you're weird or unusual for not being able to cope with life that like, this is simply a, it's an outcome of modern living is that we end up in these neurologically sometimes destitute states, but it's not because you are, there's something fundamentally wrong with you as a person or even as a physical being. It's that this is simply the accumulation of withdrawal from community, from a modern diet, from a focus on achievement and all this stuff that it just accumulates over time. And so you don't have to think, oh, I have no reason to be the way that I am. And so I'm not going to address it like it's a serious thing. Like if you can't be still, if you don't feel at peace most of the time, it's okay to do something about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's important to 
just it's just about understanding yourself more and not necessarily looking for the problem like for me i didn't even really care where it came from like maybe right. maybe this is something i'm not aware of uh and actually when i did that psilocybin trip i i like asked i was like is it something and the response i got was yep but you don't need to see it Ooh, <laughs> all that's, right that's fascinating yeah. to me yeah and so maybe it's there but i think also like it's important to um i call it like unraveling the threads you know like tracing back to where things are from, but also you don't necessarily need the whole story. Sometimes the story- and certainly can, not all at once. Yeah, sometimes the story can be helpful to process it, sometimes not. And I have seen quite a lot of people get lost in, especially in the world of psychedelics and ketamine, trying to put fragments of their story back together. And mm -hmm. I can understand why. It, that would be important to them. But I think with regards to actually like improving the quality of life, I'm not sure it, it gets there. I, I think it's more important to understand well, what, what do I want to create and what's stopping right. me from getting. And that's a big piece. And so we, we do do, we have a therapist on our program. You, you can do talk therapy, but we've never really put a focus on, you know, how was your childhood? How was this, that, and the other? And it's not to say that's not helpful, but again, it, it's our focus is, but what do you want? Like, what are you trying right. Okay, okay, I'm anxious and I have the crazy mind, I can't sleep. Great. Okay, well, that's a good good part, place to start. Let's look at why. Uh, and, you know, you can look at those physiological reasons and then dive into some of the emotional ones. And again, if, we're, if a lot of this um, processing is you know, more somatic, it might not actually have a, a memory attached to it, but it's there, it's there stored somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, I get it. The, the nervous system is basically telling the story of your life, like everything from conception to the present day, because everything that's happened to you, your, your brain and your nervous system will respond accordingly to try and protect you. And it's, it's always working in your favor. It just might not kind of pan out that way if it's, it's, if it's like anxiety, but really the anxiety or those symptoms are just signals. They're just signals saying, you know, like something's off. It's like the pain response, like something's off, like your ankle's broken, <laughs> like don't walk on it. Um, and so I think instead of like what we've been doing especially in mental health and somewhat in physical health and modern medicine is to say, okay, well, this is an uncomfortable symptom. Let's get rid of it. Um, but then, then we're not, now we're not like looking at, well, why is that symptom there in the first place? So things like functional medicine, they get a bit more into it. Uh, and, and I think we're starting to see like, psych, it's called psycho neuro, neuroimmunology, which is linking more like okay, mm. these emotional, uh, these emotions we're having that are potentially repressed or these things that have happened in our lives, how are they manifesting in as symptoms? That is becoming, and Dr. Gabo Mate has definitely been a huge proponent for that and spreading the word. And so we're kind of getting there, but I don't, he's probably sold millions of books, but still there's like a lot of people who have never heard of him or will have never any, heard of him. Yeah. It's wild to me. Or, or Even people like quote unquote in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Have... Yeah. And I forget this sometimes. I'm like, oh, well, everyone knows this. <laughs> then we get this coming down our sheets. I was like, oh no, like, don't know anything. Just because we're not really exposed to it, there's no point in school, right? <laughs> we're taught this or at any point in our adult lives, unless we like actively go and look for it or have stumbled upon it or our friends have told us about it or they suddenly see a retreat and they're like, oh, that looks interesting. Uh, and, and yeah, it's it's uh, definitely a, a missing piece. I think I tangented again from the original question. That's okay. <laughs> no, I, you know, I was thinking about the therapy concept and like, why do people go to therapy or why do people end up out of retreat? Why do they end up doing anything that's out of like the normal quote unquote pathway of their lives? And I think it really boils down to two things. Either you're trying to do something yeah. persistently and you cannot, or you're trying to stop doing something right. persistently and you cannot. Yeah. And there is a reason for that. Something happened to you that created neurological responses that are now the subconscious body, the protective nature of your body is running toward or away from something. And the program that you've designed, in my opinion, is about getting you to a base enough state that you can actually just do what you want to do. Right. right. Allowing you to function in a way that you are in control of yourself and you're no longer a slave to these automatic responses that have good intentions. Like you say, the brain yeah. and the nervous system are designed to protect you. 
But the problem is that when they don't have an off switch, it yeah. suddenly starts to eat you alive and it keeps you from living the life that you want. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the mission of the company. Again, the finding freedom and joy and it's freedom from those physical symptoms. You know, there's often it restricts people physically. Digestion's a huge one. I, I went through it. That's not a fun experience to have. And but this the, the mental prison piece is like how how much of a constraint is of our own making. You know, for me, my my mental prison was just pretty much my hundred percent my own making, right? I was just like trapping myself in in really a life that I convinced myself had to be hard and quite painful. Mm. Nobody was telling me that and it wasn't the truth. But I that's that's the lens I was seeing the world through. Mm -hmm. uh, and that had been built up again through all of my experiences. Yep, yeah, I'm sure my parents had some part to play because they did they did have really tough lives. They, they, my mom especially grew up in poverty. And so that programming was there and it's just like your, your iPhone, you can upgrade your software and it'll change. Uh, it, we really can't do that. It just takes quite a bit of, of repetition. And, well, first, like the consciousness of it, of that you even have a, a, an operating system, right? Because it, it's so default. It's very hard to see what you can change because it, it, how do you know anything else when that's your default? So like the consciousness around, okay, well, this is something that just like isn't working for me. And being able to then go through that neuroplasticity process to create new neural connections, to create a new operating system that works more in your favor, which is hard. It's, it's like energy intensive and it's hard work. I, I like the analogy of the sledging track. Like when you're mm -hmm. doing the first one, you're like Rrr. pulling yourself like, <laughs> through the snow is like really hard work. And then it gets like more fun every time. Uh, just like we're learning anything, driving a car. I was horrible at driving a car, or, like playing tennis. Like it's a language until it starts to become so default you know, Spanish for me now, I don't even think about it, it just like comes out. But at the beginning, I'd have like a headache trying to remember all of the words. And mm -hmm. so when we're trying to in ingrain these new like habits, behaviors, uh, belief systems, it's it can it can be very energy intensive. And I think it's it can be easy to just default back to where we were because that that is the least <laughs> energy required. And often yeah. in the and will go for that it will go for like the more comfort again because it thinks it's protecting you from something there's a reason did you ever read um thinking fast and slow by danny kahneman i did a while ago yes it's a good one it for anybody who is not familiar with the work the concept is you've got system one and system two thinking one of which is focused on basically free form cognition so when you go to a new country and like when we went to japan We'd get back to the hotel at night and it felt like I ran 10 marathons, yeah, even though yeah. I'd basically just ambled around a city for a day doing very little, but you're so exhausted because your mind is on yeah. overdrive trying to compute. What am I looking at? What am I smelling? What are those sounds? Yeah. System two, I believe is the, um, I can't remember which is which now, but the idea is that once it goes into that sort of automatic subconscious, right? Like driving a car. I, I did a triathlon, um, gosh, it was probably a better part of a decade ago, but I got on a bike for the first time since high school. I went for like a five mile ride. I came back. I felt like I'd done the Tour de France. I was like, why am I so exhausted? Because all those little muscles, all the, the way things are coming at you differently. You don't have a windshield in front of you like you would in a car, right? It's, it's fascinating to see how much the body is constantly trying to retire things into that automatic system, right? Yeah. So the mind is a pattern-making machine. It's a meaning-making machine. And so once it has decided this equals that, I no longer have to conquer it in a higher energy way, right? I don't need to engage in this highly caloric intensive part of my brain. And therefore it can just go in the background and we don't realize how many things we have categorized incorrectly throughout our lives as definitively this certain way, right? And because our body is just looking to put yeah. things into those buckets of, I know what this means, right? When you drive down the street, you're not paying attention to all the houses and everything because you've been down that street 10,000 times. But you probably missed so many details that you never even recorded the first time, but your brain is just like, oh, I know what that looks like. And so I imagine a lot of this repatterning is 
giving your brain the opportunity to sort of resurrect some of those decisions it made around, oh, this equals threat, right? Or this is safe and allowing that sort of neuroplasticity to kind of like reform. Absolutely. I have to have an example from one of our guests. Uh, he's awesome. You won't mind me sharing. His name is Carlos. He's a tech worker from LA. Very successful, really successful, wonderful human being. And he was just ended up having panic attacks for everything. Like everything. He had a very traumatic childhood. Very traumatic. And he, he just like, and so he'd have a panic attack, for example, in the supermarket. And then every time he went in the supermarket, you'd have a panic attack. He'd have a panic attack in the car. And then every time he was in the car, he'd have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And it just got to the point where just his whole day was just filled with panic attacks. And obviously it makes life not very fun and very challenging. And so he ended up coming on the program. He booked like the day before or something. He ended up staying in our staff room because we had no space. But he was like, I have to come. Like, I have to come like now. And it was very, very hard for him to even get to Mexico. It was, it was obviously all of the transport, everything came to panic attack. And so he, he asked us if he could have like therapy every day. Like he needed just like everything. He's like, give me everything. And one thing that was really helpful for him was actually doing the breathwork class. Obviously everything combined, he was getting into a very different state in his nervous system, but he did the breathwork class, which was kind of late in the program. And during the breath work is almost, it's a little bit like a forced hyperventilation, right? You're, you're like shifting your breathing patterns. And, but because he'd been in the environment, he got to know everyone. He felt incredibly safe, which again is the key. He felt really safe in the environment. He'd also learned so many other tools about what his body was doing in his nervous system. He was kind of in this state, which actually kind of mimicked a panic attack. And instead of completely freaking out, he was able to just like go through it, like straight through it. And Usually you'd have those sense, like sensations of feeling like he was going to die, like this was mm -hmm. the end. It was really, a really intense sensation. And so they kind of started to come up, but he was able to go right through it. And he, he said, I actually I met up with him uh, afterwards and after, like a year after the retreat almost. And he said he'd had like a panic attack. That was it. <laughs> like one since he left after having you know many, many per day. And he was just so much better able to, it's not about control. It's like just understanding a system, not being at the whim of it. Um, and also it processed a lot um, of those factors and like emotional pieces that had been leading to the panic attacks as a, as a kind of coping response or a response by the body. And so it's, it's really fascinating. So basically what he'd done there was he was able to reprogram what the panic attack even mean, means. And so when they That's come powerful. up, it really shift his physiology. So and for so folks who maybe, cause some people won't come to your facility because they're telling themselves a story. Right. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. There are people who legitimately don't have the time or money, right? The single mom who's working three yeah. jobs to keep a roof over their head. For somebody who truly is not capable of making the investment today, doesn't mean they can never make the investment. What would be like three things that you would recommend somebody do to put themselves on a path where they can start to even experience what any of this means? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And absolutely. We understand not everyone can come on the program and we are working on providing even more resources for free. But the, I think one of the most powerful pieces is again, the breath, because it's, the connection between the conscious mind and the autonomic nervous system is one of the few things we can consciously control, but we don't need to control. And so by being able to tap into the breath, it's almost like being able to send signals to the nervous system. And the inhale is linked to the sympathetic branch that, that activated fight, flight, freeze response. And the exhale to our parasympathetic, our relaxation, digestion response. So again, just like we mentioned before, that extended exhale, it's like free. Anyone could do it. Everyone would breathe. Um, you can do it, you know, throughout the day, but not even, you don't have to like set aside an hour to go and breathe. It's like, even if it's just like three breaths, when you wake up, like a couple of breaths before you eat, um, when your child's having a meltdown and you don't want to do this <laughs> or, uh, you know, it, before a, a big presentation or uh, a difficult conversation. And it's again, just sending that cue of safety to the body. Like I'm okay. Like it's okay. And it, again, brings us back into that present moment. It was as we're doing that extended exhale, we don't need to be in the future or the past. We can just very much be in the present and you know, be in our, in our surroundings. 
And that can be so powerful on many levels, uh, not just physiologically that's sending that response, but also like being able to create a pause before any kind of reaction, which again, when we're in that very reactive state, it tends to be our kind of fight response coming out. And so it can, it doesn't tend to lead to anything good unless we're in a legitimately dangerous situation. Uh, if we're just, you know, having a conversation with our partner or boss at work, being <laughs> super reactive isn't going to get us very far. And so anyone can do that. And I think that's a, a great habit to get into is just having the consciousness around the breath, also being conscious from a breathing very shallow. Um, and breath can go on for ages, but that, that's just a, a very simple technique, just extending your exhale and doing a very relaxing sigh. I mean, really looking into any information around the nervous system. We do have some on our website, which uh, everyone can look into, but um, just- And that's reprecisionhealth.com? Reprecisionhealth.com, yeah. And we're about to add a lot more resources on a platform. So that's coming very soon and it's available to everybody. And and so aside from that, I mean, there's, there's many different ways. I really like, um, it's maybe a bit cliched at this point, <laughs> like the journaling. So we use morning pages um, from the artist way which is such a great way just to dump things from your head. Uh, again, especially if you're dealing with like anxiety or like a more of a neurotic mind, it can be this big swell of chaos in the brain. So being able to just get that down onto paper can make it look a lot smaller and more manageable <laughs> and free up a lot of brain space and also can potentially break up whatever story we're telling ourselves because it can sound very ridiculous when we write it out or just <laughs> matter anymore. Uh, or even just like to-do lists, like getting as much out of your head as possible. Like the more you're carrying, that's like a very stressful place to be. So that's something I always do. I have like notes on my phone and my phone, like everything's written down. Uh, so I'm not having to carry it all the time. Um, and then I think, again, very basic, but just being able to move, but move however you can. Uh, there's just study after study showing how beneficial movement is for physical health, but also mental health. Like it's helping to produce um, a brain derived neuro uh, factor BDNF, which is incredible for uh, boosting your neural connections, but also for mood and all of so many things. Uh, and this our mitochondria, it's going to provide energy, uh, it, you know, reducing stress. But again, like being very intuitive with the body, if you're already working out six times a week and <laughs> running and doing all that, probably not. But probably moving just, enough. <laughs> yeah, and being able to like move in nature for bonus points, like getting out, getting into the daylight, as much daylight as there, as there is <laughs> wherever you're living uh, and getting into nature. I mean, there's just, you can't compete with any gadget or gizmo, the, the sort of grounding and, and calming effect of nature and movement. I think it's hard no supplements going to compare uh, and then even extra bonus points if you do that with somebody uh so just to create some kind of i mean it can be nice just to go solo if, if you're in a for example I, I do work with a lot of people all day and i'm definitely introverted so it is nice to just be with my dog and not talk to people but if uh, i if you can go with a partner or a friend or something it's a really beautiful way to disconnect and uh kind of two birds with one stone <laughs> get out in nature move with somebody three birds with one stone <laughs> lucy this has been an incredible conversation that you're doing me. truly beautiful work important work and despite the fact that there's not enough of it happening i think the world is blessed that you are doing it and that you are expanding it and i am willing to bet that if we fast forward 10 20 30 years this is going to be the the tip of a very long spear where I think you're going to do some really transformational things for a whole lot of people. I know you're already doing it, but I just have the feeling that you are you are pointed in the direction of the future. And I think the the modern world is starving for it. So thank you for doing everything you do and for sharing your a little bit of your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you also for your work and for spreading the word on on physical and mental health and especially for men, like we mentioned before this, how important it is for them to be able to embrace what they're going through and to not have this fear of vulnerability, which is well founded, I understand it. Um, but I think it's really great for men to speak up. So thank you so much for, for doing that and for also helping us spread the word on what we're doing here. You bet. Well, thanks, Lucy, and we'll hopefully talk again soon. Hopefully we'll see you in person. <laughs> oh, you bet. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>